Welcome back to Psychology Applied to Work. This is Lecture 40, Consumer Psychology. All right, hopefully you watched Lecture 39, which was a bonus um, video lecture where we talked um, about communication and culture. Now we start the last chapter, Chapter 15. So lectures 40 and 41 will be for that chapter, and lecture 40 will be consumer psychology, uh, and then we'll talk about advertising for our, our last uh, book lecture. So consumer psychology today, and we're going to talk a lot about the research methods involved in uh, um, consumer psychology. So surveys and polls are, are one of the, the prominent methods uh, for research, uh, but we're going to talk about focus groups, which is another very uh, popular method. And we're going to talk about the study of motivation and, and the research methods around motivation. And, and we're finally going to, for research methods, we're going to talk about observation, um, which is where you literally go out there and observe uh, consumers. Uh, and then we'll finish just generally talking about consumer behavior. Okay, let's get into it. This should be a pretty straightforward, uh, probably um, short lecture. And the last uh, lecture after this uh, should be even shorter. It's a pretty straightforward, uh, not too long chapter, uh, and it is a subject matter most people have at least a, a ready familiarity with, uh, at least foundationally. Um, but we're going to go back a little bit into history here, um, the history of consumer psychology. Recall lecture two, where we talked about uh, the history of IO psychology, and we mentioned uh, this individual, um, Walter Scott. Um, here's one of the, uh, one of his famous books. Um, he was uh, considered to be, um, by some, uh, you know, given credit for sort of founding IO psychology. That's, um, as we talked about in lecture two, um, psycho IO psychology has many founders. Um, but he's often, uh, you know, credited with um, you know, really putting um, uh, applied, um, uh, uh, applying it to the the uh, the business world uh, applying it in a way uh, that really get, that really launched it um, so he focused experimental psychology in, in the united states um, to advertising uh, and he wrote the theory of advertising this book is um, psychology of advertising it's written a little bit after that and he worked on uh, selecting and, and managing employees so um, really a lot of industrial psychology was was um was started uh, at least at the at the application level at the at the actual um, out in the workplace world uh, by Walter Scott, and he formed the first industrial psychology consulting company, if you will recall from lecture two, and then we're also going to talk about uh, John Watson, and John Watson is a very famous psychologist. He really was uh, the main founder uh, of um, school of behaviorism. Uh, and then B.F. Skinner really uh, stood on his shoulders and um, made uh, behaviorism, you know, very prominent in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, behaviorism was was a, a very strong pivot, uh, if you like, away from psychodynamics, away from uh, neo-Freudianism, uh, and uh, sort of a, a complete refute um, of things like an active unconscious, and and basically said that the the human is an animal like any animal, and animals are, are basically conditioned response things, that they're creatures that have a limited you know, learning and associative mechanism, and everything that they do behavior-wise um, is, is a product of you know, learned experiences, associations, conditioning, um, and that all behavior can be, can be reduced to that. Um, it had a long, long multi-decade run. Uh, it is, it's still a lot of things have been put in place or foundational today, but obviously um, we, we, we aren't quite so narrow in our thinking within the field of psychology. Um, there's, uh, there, were, there, were, there were schools of thought that were um, not agreeing with behaviorism's, uh, say, extreme position um, all during its run. Uh, and uh, there was a human, humanism approach, and, and then uh, it was really the cognitive revolution that um, you know, revivified the idea that there, you know, you can talk about conscious and you can talk about unconscious and certainly from a, 
uh, um, an implicit standpoint, still arguments about um, you know modern psychodynamic views were of an active unconscious where you actually hit you know an unconscious that's sort of able to think. It's just you're not you know, thinking the same kind of cause and effect and story kind of way that your consciousness does. That's um, generally speaking not a not, not a, a, a well accepted thing. But the idea that you have um, unconscious actions and you have you have uh, things under underneath, um, but you also have a conscious, um, and you have uh, you know cognition and th and and those sorts of things. Um, that is really supplanted behaviorism. But John Watson's really the you know, the main founder of that, uh, and it had a major major impact uh, in consumer psychology as well as well as pretty much the whole the whole domain of psychology. Um, and he proposed that uh, you know consumer behavior, like any you know human behavior, was subject to conditioning. And that uh, he brought experiments uh, and and survey methodologies to marketing, and he actually in the late twenties you know led uh, sort of an advertising focus, a pivot uh, based upon uh, this uh, school of behaviorism, you know to look at how you can condition people, and in this in this case looking at like style and image, and and, and uh, condition people to have certain kinds of associations with products, uh, with brands, and and that was that was very formative, very. Um, very influential, and it's, it's still, uh, in many ways, at play today. Uh, he went on to become uh, vice president of the J. Walter Thompson uh, Company, which is a prominent uh, ad agency. And then uh, a little further along here in the 1960s, um, the Association of Consumer Research was founded, as well as the Society for Consumer Psychology. And that was the beginning uh, of the recognition of consumer psychology as a subdomain of uh, the APA, so that was Division 23 um, of the APA. All right, now we're going to talk about we have a few slides on research methods. And the first one is going to be on surveys and polls. But uh, for, first, let's kind of look at consumer psychology, um, a 50,000 foot view. It's, it's really an amalgam. It is a cross-domain um, uh, um, uh, multiple domain school. Um, it, it, it's obviously part of uh, a subdomain within psychology, but it's also um, uh, crosses over into sociology, crosses over into anthropology, certainly crosses over into uh, economics. And in, in, in sort of modern economics right now, there's things called the behavioral economics. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of um, research, a lot of uh, theoretical frameworks um, a lot of uh, sort of statistical math within the School of Economics that uh, crosses right over with consumer psychology. Because again, e economists are into you know trying to build models that predict where the economy is going. And one of the one of the big things in there are those you know pesky humans inside the economy making decisions. And then you know how are buying decisions made? You know how is risk managed by people? Um, could that you know that that's uh, part and parcel to the same thing that consumer psychology is looking at, because the consumer psychology is usually looking at it, you know, from the person point of view or from how does this affect the, 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 the product or service that's, that's being sold, uh, whereas, you know, behavioral econo economics is looking all, uh, at the aggregate effect of the, the overall um, economic impact of all of that um, um, disparate uh, um, the human behavior. Uh, and then business administration uh, and more. I mean, obviously marketing um, uh, within the school of business, um, you know, you've got, uh, you've got marketing, you've got sales, um, and you, you could even throw communication in there. Um, so there's a lot of, of cross domain overlap, um, that consumer psychology involves itself in. Okay. Surveys and opinion polls. This is a huge part, uh, huge and uh, a hugely, um, um, utilized, but quite imperfect, um, um research method within consumer psychology. It's really built on this idea that, you know, people will tell us, you know, what they're feeling. They'll, they'll uh, tell us how they react to things. They'll give us their opinions. Uh, they'll talk about their wants and desires, uh, and we need only ask. But uh, people don't always, you know, really tell the truth. Uh, they certainly don't always tell the full truth. Uh, they certainly don't readily um, um, tell the truth if it's, if, it's, if it's highly unflattering to themselves. Um, and they might just give you partial truth. Uh, and so you have to, 
You have to recognize that when you're doing surveys and polls. As an example, you know, people tend to, you know, drink more alcohol and, and, and eat more junk food um, than they tend to tell a pollster. And, and the reason that's known is people have done some pretty difficult stuff, like where they've, they've surveyed people uh, about, like, how much alcohol did they drink, and then they actually rummaged through their trash and did... Uh, uh, inventories of you know how many beer bottles they found and that sort of thing and and I don't know how often this was done it doesn't sound like fun work but um, it's one way to validate it and you know w what was found is that people consistently you know under report um, the behaviors that might not be considered uh, you know socially acceptable uh, and so tr trying to get to the root of what people really want and and that and <laughs> do people always really know explicitly what they really want? Do people have a full grasp on their motivations and, and, and desires um, or are you going to get um, a, a, a simple narrative around things and but the, what their actual behavior might be much more complex than what they say. So humans are uh, are pesky, uh, difficult to predict uh, creatures, uh, quite complicated. Yeah, obviously, I've said many times, human behavior here, is, uh, humans are very complex, uh, and they're subject to change. I mean, the the decisions we make are contextual. Obviously, you know, we have things like personality. Uh, you know, we have self narratives. Um, we have memories and associations that 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 uh, can you know significantly affect our decisions. Uh, but each one of our decisions is inherently contextual. It's situational. Uh, and the situation, all of the complexity of any given situation, in this case we're talking about things like a buying decision, um, the, the, the dimensions at play um, are vast. Uh, and so even if we have you know, tendencies, even if we have strong personalities or drives, situationally, that's the, the, uh, the added dimensionality of the situation um, makes for uh, it, it, it makes for it um, uh, to be a difficult predictive space, and, I, and I've talked about that. Okay, focus groups. That's another very common method. I think that most of you have a, at least a vague idea what a focus group is. It's typically you're, you're, get, you're, you're surveying people, you know, not in the form of a here, take this survey, but you typically will um, have people write stuff down, um, or you might be writing it down by, by specifically asking them, but you usually have sort of a set list of things you're surveying them about. You're getting their opinions of groups, um, individuals within the group, trying to get a sense for the consensus of the group. You're paying attention to, you know, people one at a time, but you're also paying attention to see how the, how the, how the group dynamic works, um, depending upon what you're trying to do. Uh, usually there are uh, eight to 12 um, people in a survey group, if you, if you think about it. Um, you're trying to get the most bang for your buck. Uh, the person that's like facilitating it and the place that's hosting it, I mean, you gotta pay for that. So if you're doing it with just one or two people, that would dramatically slow down your ability to, to get um, to get data. Plus, you wouldn't be able to see the group dynamic. Um, and then if it was like 15, 20, 30 people, I mean, you can you can see at some point um, you're really not going to get the the type of information that you need. So it's pretty rational why it kind of comes out in, into those sizes. People are usually paid uh, to be in a focus group, not not you know not ridiculous amounts of money, but um, depends on who you're trying to attract. Um, because, you know, you, some different people have different socioeconomic uh, statuses and, and just time availability, uh, but different value, dollar values on their time. Um, you know, so you, so you only can get, like, who you can get. And uh, in order to get uh, people, you usually have to pay for it. And you're, you're, you're getting a group of people, ideally, um, that is represented, representative of your target market. Um, so you're targeting a segment of the population, uh, specific to to where you're trying to get information. So if you're trying to do an ad campaign for beer, uh, but you're actually wanting to find, um, you know, you want to increase beer for your for your ad for your client that you're building a, an ad campaign for, or or consulting on on strategy for how they do their marketing, and they've told you or your analysis said that that uh, they're not strong with uh, say college educated women for their beer sales and that they don't. You know, and they're not. Uh, uh, there's nothing in their beer that says they shouldn't be able to get a larger share of that compared to competitors, and and how much their share is. So your target market might be, um, you know, you, uh, say, 25 to 40 year old college educated women. Um, it could be more specific than that. It could be down to uh, other demographics. I mean, any any way that you can that you can look at a group, 
Um, it's potentially a target, you know, a, a sliceable target market. Um, so you're bringing a focus group together that's, that you want to be representative of who it is that you're trying to learn more information about so that you can, um, well, really, so that you can manipulate their behavior um, with, your, uh, with your brand presence, with your various marketing material, with your advertisement, uh, and, and that sort of thing. The results of a focus group are typically qualitative. You know, you're taking down information. You're the, you know, the devil's in the details, uh, and uh, the value is in the analysis and the skills of the people being able to do the analysis of a focus group. You know, you you need people that can that can synthesize, um, that can take the qualitative, the the opinions and the descriptions, and 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 really parse through it and try to figure out you know what are these people really saying um and uh um you know that's not easy and it's not um something without uh, time and you can do a focus group nowadays you can do a focus group virtually and you can do a focus group sort of classically which is you actually get the people in a room um face to face you know you get the you get the full dimensionality in a face to face where you can you can uh you read body language and there's a group dynamic involved in all those things. And that brings some extra level of um, sort of attentiveness. Um, you might get more engagement, arguably, uh, in a face-to-face. If you're having people like watch an ad or something like that or have a discussion about um, what they feel about a particular brand, um, you might get just like a, a brick-and-mortar um, um, go-to-the-classroom type classroom um, because you're sitting there and other students are there and there's a teacher there, um, that, 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 that physicality, the fact that, that your presence is fully embodied, as are the, everybody else, um, that can, can make someone a little bit more engaged, all other things being equal, than if you're sitting in front of your laptop and uh, you got your webcam on and you're staring at other people in a little, that are also little boxes um, and nobody can you know, say for sure whether you happen to have another monitor with something else on and you're only half engaged, um, you know, possibly what you're doing right now, who knows. Um, so there's a downside to virtual, uh, obviously. Um, but um, one thing that face-to-face can have is you can have some asymmetries in your participation um, that might be a little bit um, more difficult to to fix. Um, as a facilitator, you're trying to get everybody's opinion, but inevitably, when you have a group dynamic, you, you often have people that that uh, hog the microphone, so to speak, loudest voices in the room. You get introverted people that are uncomfortable talking in front of more than one person. And, and when you're in a virtual environment, um, it, it's a little bit easier, or perhaps it's a, arguably a lot easier if you're a good facilitator and, uh, to get everyone's opinion. And even if somebody's really dominant, you can still like constrain the conversation, um, you know, by uh, um, by you know calling on certain people. And if somebody's really introverted. Um, oftentimes they're still, um, depending upon what, you know how much familiarity they have with the virtual environment, uh, which post COVID uh, is pretty high now. Um, even really introverted people, you know, can can often share uh, share fully. So arguably, a virtual environment allows you to to gather more uh, information. It also tends to cost less. Um, and the virtual environment allows you to ex- you don't have to have find people that are willing to like drive across town and show up at, at, at whatever space that you've got to do your focus group. Um, you can potentially tap into people um, wherever they, they happen to be all around, all around the world. Uh, and so you're able to, to cast your nets wider, so to speak, um, and get a sample set that, that might be more representative um, and um, might be, you know, more uh, uh, you know, diversely representative, as in, is it more 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 of a ran, true random sampling of uh, of your target market? Um, all right, so that's focus groups. It should make uh, hopefully that makes pretty good sense. Uh, motivations also. Um, there's research methods associated with motivation, and particularly motivation research, uh, at least in this area. Um, a lot of it was pioneered by Ernest Ditcher. When I'm when I'm giving out names here, you know, I've, I've just I've said just said a couple. Uh, those are sort of iconic names or or good example exemplars. Um, they're by no means the uh, the only people involved in these things. I mean, the the, the number of people involved in in the in the build up to 
recognizing consumer psychology was substantially more people than what I presented, and, and certainly, um, you know, motivation research uh, is a huge field as well. Um, but this particular individual, uh, um, Mr. Ditcher, um, he, he did uh, one of the, one of the things that's sort of famous in the in the field. Uh, and in the in the field of sort of product marketing, is he solved a problem uh, with um, why consumers weren't buying cake mixes? So back in the um, sort of post World War II era, um, when uh, um, people when when food was the um, food industry was figuring out how to make more and more convenient, um, uh, more um, more pre made stuff, adding more convenience to the household, um, cake mixes started to, to show up and they were all you needed to do basically, you know, add water. Um, but, uh, you know, or, or add milk, you know, you basically add a liquid to this cake mix and you've got a cake and they weren't selling, uh, not nearly as much as they'd hoped. And one of the things that, uh, um, Ernest Ditcher did, uh, in studying this was realize that, you know, a cake was something at the time, you know, you had a lot of, uh, stay at home moms, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of cultural emphasis on, you know, homemaking and a cake was something special. Um, you know, a cake was something made with love and, and uh, um, people weren't buying them if it, if it wasn't something they could like make. And, and even though they really wanted the convenience, um, because, uh, you know, as, as a, a, a stay at home mom is a very, very busy person. Um, so one of the things that Ernest Ditcher did was, um, did a little bit of a hack. Um, he basically took the eggs out and made it so that you had to add the eggs. Uh, and now you were a participant. Now it was just a little bit, now it was just added convenience, but it was still your cake. You know, you, you still made this cake because you had to, you had to take the liquid and you had to, you had to add your own eggs and you had to make sure you had the eggs. And then you just had this other mix. Um, and that was just enough. It was just enough for, um, uh, the, uh, the, um, um, homemaker to feel like it was, um, it was their creation and, uh, cake mix mixes took off. Now that's probably not a thing that, uh, uh, would, would matter today. Um, you know, but, uh, but, uh, in the post-war years in the second half of the uh, 20th century, uh, that was kind of a fun, a fun fact, um, of the, of these complicated humans that, uh, you couldn't make it too easy for something like a cake because people wanted to participate in it. So that's an interesting uh, tidbit there. Um, so the, the, the up to their participation made the cake, uh, made the cake something that they made. Um, another thing that uh, Ditcher did uh, is, he, is he did uh, uh, really deep, uh, um, deep probing, uh, deep, uh, deep interviews associated with how people felt about particular products and services. So he sort of pioneered um, how to um, you know really get down to uh, somebody's relationship um, uh, and motivational associations to a, a product or a service, and by doing that, you, you know you, you get beyond what limited information you'd get in in surveys and polls. Another thing with the motivational research here was this thing called projective techniques, and here you're talking about sort of leftover Freudianism, um, psychodynamics. Um, and this is sort of this active and unconscious kind of view. And the idea would be that people would, would be projecting their values, um, projecting their motives, you know, onto brands, onto products. Um, and that, uh, um, if, if you could probe their deeper, deepest, uh, sort of feelings and deeper associations and find out what's really going on, you know, and sort of do a, a psychoanalysis type thing and have a narrative about what their true, you know, unconscious motivations are that that could help you in, uh, in selling products. Um, you know, the problem with that, a couple problems with that. Um, one is, uh, you're still limited to what you can get people to tell you. And then you have to sort of infer your psychodynamic narrative to figure out what their deeper motivations are. And, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to know if you're right. Um, and overall, um, this, this psychodynamic approach, like a, like a lot of psychodynamics, um, is criticized for um, lack of reliability. And that gets to this whole active unconscious thing, which is, is a strong con consensus uh, in psychology right now that, uh, um, that doesn't really subscribe to that notion. Okay, um, let's keep going on research methods and talk about something pretty basic, just watching, you know, just observation.
an option to, typical is go and quietly watch shoppers you know you might be pretending to shop yourself uh you might be you know up up uh in a in a vista if you have a second you know uh, an uh, upper floor window where you can look down to the store or you might have ca cameras um, and just watch behaviors um, and a lot can come just from that so direct op direct observation so as an example um, in some research associated with uh, cereals and snacks um, it was observed that when when mothers and children were shopping together that uh, you know when the that the children would ask uh, for a specific product and, and when, when the children would, would ask for things, um, that this relates to cereals and snacks, that about two-thirds of the time they were very specific, that they wanted a particular cereal, they wanted a particular snack. And in this study, they found that um, mothers capitulated quite a bit, quite often. Uh, and uh, they would, uh, um, uh, when they would make a purchase, uh, that you know, two-thirds of the time the, the child was asking for something specific, and half the time... Um, the the mother would actually buy that specific thing, so um, you know that that uh, um, is good information to have if you're if you're trying to market to uh, uh, um, if you're trying to sell cereals and snacks. That actually tells you that what what you can get the kid to be aware of actually will uh, will pull through uh, um, a significant amount and result in the parent making that decision. Another thing on observation, um, you can. Uh, but by doing some experiments and by looking at what where people um, how they interact with a store, for instance, um, you can determine like best product placement uh, as well as so like it's you can Google it um, and get some pretty good information about like how a supermarket is strategically laid out, you know, and what do they put right at the entrances. What do they put towards the the last? What do they typically put at the last aisle? What do they typically have at the at the uh, um, the, the, the corners, um, you know, what do they typically have in the middle? Um, and then the, the shelf heights, you know, the, um, you know, what do you put at the very bottom and what do you put at the very top versus what you put on the easy, easy to reach. Um, and, and when you're, when you're looking at what kind of products you want to sell and you want to sell the most of them, you're trying to get that right there in, in front of people. Um, you're trying to, uh, um, uh, make sure people can find your product. Uh, and by doing observation and seeing how how much time people typically spend, and uh, and and then you could do experiments as well. You basically play with different types of layouts, uh, and then uh, do observation. So a great deal of work has been done on this, especially in the in the supermarket uh, business, but also in in you know big department stores uh, as well. And in fact, uh, you know there's there's billions of dollars um, chasing this. Um, so there's actually some pretty pretty mature techniques. Um, at figuring out how to, uh, you know, uh, optimally um, uh, lay out and display uh, uh, in a store. Uh, but uh, all these research methods, you know, it, it takes time and money. Um, and, and it uh, um, it really sees what was purchased, you know, but uh, just by watching it doesn't tell you, the, you know, why did people purchase that. So it's uh, just one part, uh, one piece of the puzzle. Okay, uh, and then... Uh, um, those were the research methods. Let's talk just sort of a little bit in general here about consumer behavior. Um, consumer behavior is really studying, you know, what what affects shopping behavior. You know, uh, what affects buying decisions. You know, and, and, and what are the underlying motivations associated with uh, consumer behavior. Um, and uh, behavior is influenced more than simply you know your ad campaign. And our, our next lecture will be about advertising specifically. Um, but there's a, a heck of a lot more that affects somebody's consumer behavior. And so uh, we were just talking about the layout of a supermarket or a department store. The retail layout, just what you see, um, your experience, how you feel, um, what you can see, what's easy access, um, um, uh, all the dimensions associated with workplace conditions as well uh, you know, would, would still apply to, to your uh, experience. So the arrangement, the dimensions, even parking, you know. Um, how, how easy is parking? How do you feel about going in? Um, 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 how do you feel entering the store? Um, also, the the overall atmosphere. I mean, we talked a little bit in workplace conditions about the subtle effects uh, of the color and music, and it's difficult to tie that directly to productivity. Uh, but there is a little bit of work that shows that you know there's uh, you can you can influence mood, uh, and there's some evidence that you might in certain circumstances you can in influence uh, spending habits. 
um, you know, with sort of that ambiance effect with that can be, you know, how, how well the lighting and the color and the, and the sound and the music. And there's personal factors. Um, um, demographics uh, um, are, are, are a huge part of it. Um, the in, individual differences and, the, you know, the averages across all the different ways that you can slice and dice um, people into groups. You know, obviously demographic groups like d d targeting different ages, um, uh, their socioeconomic status, uh, there'd, be, there'd be ethnicity, uh, there'd be locality. Uh, you know, you get these little cultures in different parts of the country. Um, and then if you just go across town, you can, you can come from, you know, these people are, are all, you know, mostly Polish, but uh, these people over here, you know, were Irish Catholic and, uh, and the, the neighborhoods are, are still kind of like that. You'd actually, there'd be ways in which they'd be, behave the same on the average and there'd be, be, be ways in which they would, they would, um, you know, have different types of susceptibilities, social influence, for instance, uh, on the average. Um, yeah, the individuals are individuals, and so the, the variability from an individual is vast, vast. And the variability of an individual typically exceeds, you know, an individual to individual to individual is typically a stronger amount of variance than anything, you, any kind of grouping you can do to put, 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 put people in. But the reality is if you're trying to figure out consumer behavior and you're trying to basically manipulate it to try to get people to sell your products, I mean, the, the, you you just can't take it down to the individual level because you, you, know, you spend your, your whole bunch of money and time and now you know one person. Well, that, that person, maybe they buy your product and then, okay, um, now what? Um, so you, you really are always, almost always targeting, a, you know, some, some sort of group um, or, or large meta group or even a very narrow group, but it's still a group. And you have to model that group um, and, and, you, and, you, and you need to come up with ways that you think are going to influence, you know, the average in that group enough uh, that it, that it's worth your time and money um, for your marketing campaign. Um, and so, um, trying to understand, uh, you know, the the ways you can group people to into segments of a target market, uh, and then what do we know about them through by doing surveys and polls and and obser observations and focus groups and deep interviews and that sort of thing? Can you build up a, a, a um, characteristics of a target market and say something about what their attitudes are for towards shopping, uh, attitudes towards shopping for clothing, attitudes towards shopping for, for food. And, 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 all, you know, it can even be attitudes towards shopping for baby food versus, uh, um, food for themselves, attitudes towards dining out. Um, how much do, does their peer group influence them? How much does, uh, um, what they see on TV influence, influence them? How much does like a celebrity influence them? what is a relevant celebrity or an influencer for that group. So it's really um, all over the map because people are <laughs> all over the map. Um, so, so a lot, a lot of time and effort is spent trying to really slice and dice. And nowadays you have big data, right? Nowadays we all have our um, you know, online behavior to some extent <laughs> digitally stocked and, uh, um, and uh, and characterized and and various uh, organizations are selling data about ourselves um, and, and to some extent it's to you know target us as a single individual to a particular a particular ad um, but that's not like one company like scouring all the available data to find you it's more of the the company that in this case is trying to sell something um, is going to companies that have you know, a whole bunch of aggregated data on online behavior. And they say, I want, I'm going to pay you money and you give me all the names um, uh, of, of uh, people that fit this profile. And then you're, you happen to fit that profile. And then all those people get targeted ads. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it's very sophisticated now. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's ubiquitous. And, um, and uh, it's evolving. Um, we're, we are all... <laughs> um, um, categorized and, and targeted. And so another thing with um, consumer behavior is looking at various ways you can pray, you can do brand placement. Um, and this can be like, this can be a targeted ad, but if a brand placement is usually something that um, um, is either like an ad uh, in on the television you're watching, an ad on the website that you're going, but it's, uh, uh, but it's also how can you sort of surreptitiously put the brand you're trying to sell into some content. So you're watching a movie and the, the uh, protagonist uh, takes, a, takes a drink of Coca-Cola. 
some case, in some cases it's just because that's what the the scene care, uh, need, uh, called for, uh, but in other cases that's because you know the company actually um, uh, um, could have paid for that, um, and uh, you know sometimes it's quite subtle and sometimes it's kind of in your face and takes you out of the show a little bit. But but uh, getting your product you know uh, placed fa favorably in a flattering way uh, within content uh, is a uh, um, you know, a great way to sort of get around the active resistance that people have uh, uh, for advertisement, and it's used it's used extensively. Um, brand loyalty is a is a part of uh, you know consumer behavior. Really, this is the the whole in group stuff. You know, uh, um, if you've got something that 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 you feel is definitely part of your in group, or here's our in, this is our our in group, and we all you know like this particular beer. Or we all like our Carhartt flannels, or or whatever. Um, you're doing signaling uh, when you um, have brand loyalty. You know that you're part of that group, and that's really what what um, you know companies are trying to do when they're trying to establish their brand and they're trying to get you to have a personal relationship um, with their brand. I mean, it's they're hacking into that um, in-group biological drive, uh, and they're trying to uh, they're trying to get you to have those sorts of associations. Um, it, so it, it, it's something that you, you if you trust it, you, but the, the things that come along with an in-group is you want to signal that you're part of this in-group. You often want to signal that you're absolutely not part of a, an, a, an out-group. Um, uh, and uh, um, you, you have high trust for the things that happen within that in-group. But you also have brand loyalty that's sometimes just habit forming. You know, it's just what you're used to. Um, you can't really articulate, you know, any strong feeling of associate of a so strong association, but hey, it's what you're used to, and it's easy, and it seems to work. Um, you know, that's not exactly the kind of brand loyalty that you might, uh, um, um, you know, fight for. You know, that might you might not get super upset if that particular brand isn't available at a store. Um, if it's just a, if it's just a habit, unless you're you know a really strong creature of habit. Um, but you should get an idea here what, what I'm talking about with brand loyalty. And then product pricing also is something that gets studied and is how it affects consumer behavior. Uh, price is an indicator of lots of stuff. Um, you know, some, sometimes it's often correlated with quality. The more expensive, generally um, considered higher quality or at least higher status or expected to have higher features. It really depends on the product. You know, a luxury brand um, is obviously expected to be high quality and, 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 and have, have good sort of features. But, you know, with a luxury brand, you're, you're typically buying that name and you're basically status signaling uh, that I can buy the best and and I can I have so much money and status and power and, and friends um, uh, with my uh, I'm showing you with my super awesome handbag that costs you know two thousand dollars or, or whatever um, you know that handbag uh, isn't holding uh, volumetrically is not holding any more uh, than a fourteen dollar handbag um, yeah, but what it uh, and, and it's probably got a, a, a clasp you know, or a zipper that's a higher quality and will probably last more clasps, clasping and unclaspings and zipping and unzipping than your $14 handbag, um, but nowhere near, um, uh, nowhere near to justify, you know, the, the, uh, you know, 100 X, uh, or more price. Um, so a lot of, uh, a, a lot of price is also a status, uh, element, but that's a huge part of consumer behavior. You know, that, that whole signaling thing. Um, you're in, you've got in-group stuff, you've got status stuff, um, and then in, in, and price is also uh, affects behavior when people don't have much money. Um, you know, in the in 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 you know they're making decisions based on price, and they're trying to save as much money as they as they can. So price price cuts in all different ways uh, in terms of how it drives consumer behavior. Hopefully, all that uh, makes sense. Um, okay, uh, that is the end of um, uh, lecture forty. Uh, for um, uh, the first part of chapter 15. Um, we are going to cover the other, the second half, so to speak, of chapter 15 next, uh, on, and we're going to talk about advertising. Um, but that's actually going to be an even shorter lecture. Uh, and then we'll, we will have wrapped up the book. Okay, what did we talk about today? Uh, in consumer psychology, uh, we talked about uh, several different types of research methods, like surveys and polls. We talked about focus groups, and we talked about uh, motivation. We talked about observation, uh, and then we d dug in a little bit uh, into consumer behavior. And for our last book lecture, um, we're going to talk 
about advertising next. So we'll talk about what are the different uh, purposes and types of advertising. Uh, we will talk about how you assess the effectiveness of advertising. And we will talk about, um, you know, the, the um, reactions, you know, how to test to how people reacted to it. Um, and we'll talk about how do you advertise, um, how do you do advertising that's really targeted towards specific demographics. Okay, uh, we will see you for lecture 41.